Thank you. Um, Randy and I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's session, um, Connecting Returning Citizens to Employment Resources. Um, oh, your PowerPoint. Oh, sorry, <laughs> hold on a second. Sorry, that's right. I just right. realized it wasn't up. Hold on one moment and I will share the screen. There we go. There we go. Um, so this is by um, Project D3, um, Educate, Empower, and Employ. So the next slide. And again, this is Connecting Returning Citizens to Employment Resources. Again, I'm Kimberly Gerlach. I work for the Pennsylvania Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, I am a program specialist. I've been um, with the state for seven, a little over seven years now. Um, my current role is that I am the BJJS statewide um, specialist, and I also cover the adult uh, reentry. Um, so this is part of what I do on a daily basis. Randy. And again, uh, my name is Randy Loss. Um, I used to work for the Pennsylvania VR agency. I am currently with the state mental health agency. I'm the employment first lead. And I'm working on all things that are employment related in regards to supported employment, supported education that um, are dealing with uh, persons with mental illness in the state of Pennsylvania. And by the way, uh, the BJJS, I know Kimberly had mentioned it, oh. that's the Bureau of Juvenile Justice Services, uh, BJJS for short. So our objectives today is that you're gonna learn about the needed partners to successfully transition individuals from um, incarceration to the community. We're also going to teach you to identify common issues facing returning citizens as they return to their communities. We're also going to um, help you gain knowledge to find resources available um, for returning citizens so that they may experience success in employment. And we're also going to learn about different emerging models of reentry um, with several states. Next slide. So we're going to start off with a poll question. Um, so what we're wanting to know is what percentage of your caseload has a criminal justice record? Um, is it zero to 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, or 75 to 100% of your caseload has um, somebody with a criminal record? And we'll take about another 15 to 20 seconds for folks to answer that. And uh, not surprising, it's very similar. Uh, the numbers we're seeing, similar to what we saw this morning with uh, folks working with uh, individuals in the juvenile justice system. Mm -hmm. I do have somebody that just put in chat that their caseload is 100%. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like about 70%, uh, basically 70% of the people uh, indicated that it's zero to 25%. Um, and we feel that it's important, even if you're working with one individual in your caseload that has a criminal record, to be able to uh, know what are resources that are available to these individuals. And just to take a, a step back really quick, in regards to the term we used in our objectives, we're calling returning citizens. A lot of systems call them ex-offenders, ex-inmates, whatnot. We want to use positive language. You also want to use people first language. And uh, Philadelphia actually started it, I think was the first uh, large city that started using the term of returning citizen because really we want to help the person return to the community and we want to help them return to being a citizen, a part of society. So if we're going to go on to some definitions. Um, we want to make sure that these are um, clearly defined and everybody is on the same page. Um, and you'll see as we go through our presenta presentation, we're going to keep coming back to these words. Um, so there's a big difference between probation and parole. Um, probation is usually um, somebody that is a first time offense, minor offenses, they can get put on probation. Um, it's usually court ordered supervision um, instead of being sentenced um, to prison time. Um, where parole um, 
that is somebody that's been incarcerated, usually in a state prison. Um, let's say they've gotten a, a sentence of a maximum of five years. They will, maybe they are getting out after two and a half years um, on good behavior, whatever. <clears throat> they will serve the other two and a half years of their sentence on parole um, with a parole agent. Um, your summary offenses, those are your most minor types of um, offenses. Those are usually non-traffic violations. Um, those can be things such as disorderly conduct, um, loitering, harassment, those kind of charges. Um, usually they may end up in a fine. Um, they don't end up in jail time. Your infractions, um, those are the least serious types of crimes. Um, again, um, these can result in fines. Um, it's usually somebody breaking up law. Um, there's usually no jail time associated with these either, um, but this can be something along the lines of trespassing, littering, um, disturbing the peace, traffic tickets are included in here. So that's what, where the infractions fall. Your misdemeanors and your felonies, those are where you're gonna start seeing your um, jail time. So a misdemeanor, is usually a criminal offense um, that is carries a jail time of less than a year. For most states, your state may be a little bit different, but in general terms, usually it is less than a year. Um, and it's usually served in a county jail. Um, your felonies, and I will say, I know that some misdemeanors, it, it can be longer than that, and some misdemeanors could be a, in, in a state jail. Your felonies, that is going to be in, um, a state prison or, or a federal prison, um, and usually those are more than a year. Um, I know that here in PA, um, pretty much you know that the difference between, so if somebody's coming out of prison, if they come to me and they say that they served over two years, I automatically know that pretty much guaranteed they're coming out of a state prison, because here that's where the defining line is, is 24 months or more, and you're gonna be in a state prison if it's less than a 24 month a sentence, you're gonna be serving that in a county jail. So your felonies and your misdemeanors are all, bo both of those classes are broken down into classes. So a misdemeanor may be a misdemeanor class A, B, or C, where a felony will be broken down into classes of A, B, C, D, or E. And usually those classes in a felony are broken down according to the amount of time that you're gonna be serving for your felony. And one thing I wanna to add to that, thank you, Kimberly, uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, in order to kind of untangle that, unpack that, um, what is the person's criminal offense, it's really advantageous for you to talk to the probation or parole officer. They're more than willing to share information and likely the information they can share you can't get from anywhere else uh, because they're agents of the court. So they have access, ready access to this information. And again, uh, individuals that are in a criminal justice system, their oral history might not be the best so you might not know what is truly the case. They might indicate they don't know, but they do, but they're trying to uh, possibly hide it or possibly uh, uh, find ways around what they have uh, so that they can get things that uh, they legally aren't able to access. So um, best thing to do is talk to your probation officer or your parole officer. They're gonna be a great resource in regards to getting the, the, the down low on um, what the person's uh, criminal record truly is. Mm -hmm. Now, moving on to the mission and vision statements, we're going from some very high level stuff, just like we did in the Juvenile Justice One in the morning. We did some national type stuff. We did some generalized terms. Uh, we're doing the very same thing for what's happening with the adult system. So we're gonna talk about stuff at high level, stuff that many states um, have commonalities in terms of definitions. And every state, every agency, every uh, department usually has what are called mission and vision statements. And the reason we're bringing these up is, this is kind of your connector in terms of if you're trying to collaborate with partners, where can I start collaborating? What are the types of things that I can use to my advantage to be able to make those collaborations? And uh, it starts at the foundational level of mission and vision statements. And the mission statement should guide the actions of the organization, spell out its overall goal, what do you do, provide a path, what do we provide to get the person to those goals? and guide decision-making. How do we go about accomplishing these things? Vision statement, much narrower, future-oriented declaration of organizations, organizations' purpose and aspirations. And I have here a couple mission and vision statements I pulled from the state of North Carolina, again, trying to bring a funnel down. Um, 
what we have listed here are Department of Health and Human Services, where their state VR agency lies, and the Department of Public Safety, where the Department of Correction, or excuse me, the, the well, Department of Corrections and the Juvenile Justice System lie within North Carolina. And I'm not going to read all this information, but I do want to uh, mention the stuff that's highlighted, like the word collaboration in the mission statement of human services is listed in the Department of Public Safety's vision statement. So there's a connector there. There's a connector between the two partners in regards to they want to collaborate. That's great. Use it as a talking point to be able to make it to the next level, to be able to, to actually collaborate, to uh, develop those relationships with your partners across the aisle in the criminal justice system. And uh, what I have highlighted in green for uh, the mission statement of the Department of Public Safety, I have developed progressively responsible behavior. A very similar terminology to the DHS, the Human Services vision statement, which I have highlighted says promote well-being for all North Carolinans. So if you're helping a person develop responsible behavior, you're helping them promote their well-being. So again, there's connectors there. There are components that exist that are threads that you take to weave together to weave that collaboration. So also another tool uh, is what's called a memorandum of understanding. It's a very important tool that you can use. It's a critical collaboration tool that identifies roles and responsibilities. Funding could be a component, and we'll talk more about that uh, just briefly. We had done that in our, our juvenile justice session in the morning. Um, the state VR agency and the uh, juvenile justice agency for the state uh, collaborated together to develop a $3.1 million a year memorandum of understanding. And what's so important about the um, Memorandum of Understanding is it provides consistency. So if Kimberly is going to provide service A and me, Randy, are going to provide service B, whether it's to Sally or Harry or Tom or Jerry, um, we're providing the same service. And if we're in different departments or different agencies or agencies within different departments, we're making sure that whatever we do, we telegraph and we talk to the other person. So Kimberly's talking to me, I'm talking to her. Yes, I did this for Tom. You need to do that for Tom. Yes, I did this for Jerry. You need to do that for Jerry. A memorandum of understanding puts in writing uh, what has to happen, when it has to happen, who's providing the service, and where it's going to happen. Uh, what's nice about memorandums of understanding, too, is that it um, usually can cover a state, cover agencies, and cover services. So if um, you're doing a service, say, in Pittsburgh, PA, but a person in Philadelphia, PA, is getting the same services from the partner in the memorandum of understanding because it's in writing. Um, the old saying is, if it's not written down, it's as if it didn't exist. This is a written document that helps collaborators collaborate. We'll talk more about a memorandum of understanding later in the, in the presentation. So we're going to go on to our, our second polling question. And we want to know, who do you think your potential partners are? Is it probation? Is it parole? Is it corrections, drug and alcohol counselors? Or is it district attorneys? Or is it all of the above? Randy, I've seen a couple of chats come in saying probation and parole. I've seen some come in saying uh, all of the above. We'll wait another five or so seconds to uh, finish up this poll. Don't be shy, folks. Please feel free to jump in and, and uh, cast your lot. Okay. Uh, yes, the answer is all the above. That is correct. And I notice a lot of people didn't list the district attorney's office. And I say that while, yes, probation and parole are um, definitely important partners, as I mentioned a few moments ago, drug and alcohol counselors, yes, definitely important because substance abuse is a uh, disability. Uh, corrections officers, yes, what they're doing on the inside can have an effect on what happens on the outside. But I want to ask you folks to consider the district attorney's office, even though many of you answered um, uh, all the above, not many people put down district attorney's office and the district attorney's office, they are the organization at the county level, at the state level, that's going to be determining what level of crime are we going to um, charge this person with 
in the court, in the court of law. So if you can work with the district attorney's office, the one who is setting up what is the crime, what is the charge that's going to be put against this person, and help them to understand the nature of disability, the, the extent of disability, you know, the challenges of trauma. I'm not asking to go to the district attorney's office and ask for a pass, but helping them to understand what is going on in this person's life. You know, substance abuse, yeah, it's more than just a, a criminal charge, but it's something that um, has some uh, disability-related aspects to it. It's mental health. The largest mental health organization or uh, uh, facilities in, in the country today are state prisons. Why is that? Because so many people that have mental health issues are ending up, you know, they're offending uh, laws of society, laws of, of uh, the community. Uh, they're being charged, they're being put in prison. That shouldn't be. And how can we help to turn that tide? We need to talk to the district attorneys, make them familiar with who we are as an organization. See, let them see that there may be alternatives that uh, can be brought to the, the situation if VR can be involved. So it's very important that the um, uh, district attorney's office be considered as well. Again, everybody's important in this conversation, but I just wanted to throw that out there for consideration. Now, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna talk about uh, North Carolina resources and potential collaborators. So again, we're trying to bring that um, funnel down from the state level, from national types of perspectives, from more general perspectives, to talk about what's going on at the state level. And then when we get to Pennsylvania, Kimberly and I are gonna be talking about what's happening at the local level, you know, where it's impacting the needs of the individuals. So with North Carolina, um, back in 2017, they developed uh, a North Carolina reentry action plan. And the premise behind it is to facilitate transition to society, identify resource gaps. And at the end of 2017, there were 14 reentry councils across um, uh, the state of North Carolina, and they're receiving both state and federal funding. And also, too, there's 20 councils that are across North Carolina right now. So, um, uh, I think it's important that to, to find out what those, what those um, uh, excuse me, reentry council, excuse me, reentry councils are doing right now in terms of how they're trying to identify resource gaps. They're probably looking for partners such as VR. Uh, how can they facilitate the transition to society? So again, transition, while it's something that's very um, relevant to students with disabilities that are transitioning from high school to uh, work or high school to um, post-secondary school, it's also very relevant to people that are, leave, that are leaving the criminal justice system. Again, it's a different transition of sorts, but still many of the supports that they need are very similar to have to be successful. Um, now, the State Reentry Council Partners in North Carolina are the Department of Justice, which makes sense, Office of the Courts, again, district attorneys, you know, um, agents of the court, Health and Human Services, where uh, VR lies in North Carolina. Commerce Division of Workforce Solutions, again, that makes sense, you know, being able to get training, be able to get job opportunities in front of these individuals. The college system, again, a very critical component because I know, especially working in the mental health field, education helps an individual lift themselves out of poverty. If they have a post-secondary uh, uh, certification, uh, degree, something that, that is post-secondary, it's going to give them the skills that are going to get them better pay. So that's very important to have them as a partner. And lastly, the Department of uh, Transportation Division of Motor Vehicles, again, having an ID, having a driver's license, very critical uh, uh, partners to have in that conversation. So I'm going to see if this will work. Sorry, this is an experiment with you folks, but um, this is the map of uh, North Carolina. And I'm going to click on the map, and it should open up the link an active link, an interactive map. There we go. And if I click on Wake County, sorry, COVID-19 is everywhere. Um, I'm not gonna click on the actual um, county because it's gonna take me to the link, the capitalreentry.org link. But um, this is an interactive map of the 20 programs that have started across the state. And um, it provides points of contact. It provides different services that are being offered. It provides information that speaks to um, what is available for the returning citizen uh, that can help them to um, uh, return to the community safely and with success.
So we're going to close this out. So Randy, did you click on the map? I did. Oh, did, did it? Nothing happened. It, it did not. It didn't show. It didn't come up. Is anything showing up at all? It just the PowerPoint page. I just want you to be aware. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll just close this out then. Um, Hold on one second, please. And while you're doing that, somebody did put in the chat, they did ask, does every state have a reentry council? They do, don't they? Um, yes, every state should have a reentry council. Maybe not um, every county. Right, and I'm not okay. sure. I do apologize if, um, can you see my screen? What can you I see? I can. Is, is the PowerPoint up? It's, you need to start the slideshow. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, there we go, it took us back. Um, so while that was an experiment, folks, I do, do apologize on that. But um, yes, every state has a reentry council. Um, there is federal funding from the Department of Justice and um, much of it started in 1974 with the um, Juvenile Justice Act, 1974, uh, the federal government started issuing funds to states to develop um, these types of organizations, um, both at the state level and at the county level, to be able to devise um, ways to help individuals uh, re-enter society, whether they be juveniles or whether they be um, adults. Uh, it's morphed into, now it's both juveniles and adults. Again, back in 1974 when it first started, it was just primarily juveniles. But these, you know, systems have seen a need and as the program has evolved, they've seen that it, it's also needed for adults. So every state does have an organization um, that has federal funds to issue for grants to develop um, re-entry programming for um, your state. So uh, again, if you look at the presentation that we had done in the morning for juvenile justice, uh, we spoke heavily on that. Um, there are many different organizations in Pennsylvania, it's called the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. But that's not the same name across the board. Uh, it's gonna be something different in each state. So you have to look, uh, what is the, uh, the juvenile justice grant funding organization? You're gonna find your thread that's gonna take you to these types of programs. So, um, uh, and again, this is the um, organization in North Carolina in Pennsylvania, it's the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Uh, in North Carolina, it's called the Governor's Crime Commission, the GCC, and it's the Chief Criminal Justice Advisory Body to the Governor and the Secretary of Public Safety, Corrections. Um, there's several committees. Uh, one is in regards to uh, criminal justice improvement. One is in regards to crime victim services, and the third one is in juvenile justice. And um, uh, they have funding as you can see in 2018 that if issued a hundred million dollars in grants across the state of north carolina now again not every state has that much money for their, their programs but every state does issue those types of things those types of grants across their state for re-entry so fair chance hiring law i'm going to turn it over to you uh, yes, and I just want to see, I've been seeing the chat that people are sharing reentry resources. So thank you everybody for, for sharing your reentry resources. That's awesome that you guys are connecting all these things. Um, so the Fair Chance Hiring Law, this is North Carolina. It was actually their um, at, uh, Senate Bill um, 562, and that was passed in May, of eight, May 8th of 2019. So basically what this did is it had automatic expungement for certain criminal charges. Um, it, expung it has an expungement of nonviolent misdemeanor convictions after seven years of good behavior. And then it'll ha it has expungement of nonviolent felony after 10 years of good behavior. And this goes back to our definitions prior for misdemeanor and felonies. Um, so when the, the um, charges are expunged, it's not available to the public but it is still available to the district attorneys and it can be considered by the courts um, for sentencing um, if a person re-offends. Well, I think this, I, I think this, I just want to say, I think it's important uh, in regards to having these types of laws. Now, not every state has these types of laws. I think in the wake of what we've seen over the past few weeks, states are going to be um, 
moving towards these types of laws uh, because we want to be able to make sure that individuals aren't um, judged on their past behavior but what they're currently doing and a lot of what happens in laws today they're very punitive in the adult system uh, so much so that it affects them not just while they're incarcerated but because of their felony because of the misdemeanor or whatever um, the punitive nature of what's what they're charged with continues on business is not hiring because they have a felony business is not hiring because of misdemeanor have a criminal record so these are efforts that states are taking, which I'm excited to see. They're gonna help um, turn the tide for these individuals. And that's exactly why it's called second chance. It's giving them that second chance. Right. Um, so I, I do wanna say for the, for the North Carolina, um, when I was doing the research for this, um, the nonviolent misdemeanor and the nonviolent felony, how your state um, defined that, it didn't make any changes to the definitions for those terms. And again, um, what you're going to have to do for those folks that are on the webinar today, you're going to have to do a little research, look at what your states are doing in this regard. You know, um, second chance, fair chance, you know, use those kinds of definitions, Google them for your state to find out what your state is doing in regards to trying to undo very punitive laws. Like in Pennsylvania, um, if you have a felony, um, it either is taken from you after age 70 or after you've been dead for seven years. So it's very punitive in Pennsylvania for a felony. So, I mean, you can get a pardon from the governor, you can work towards expungement, but both are very difficult and both cost a lot of money. So, and for folks that um, are in, in many cases in poverty, that's not a good direction for them to go. So um, these types of laws are very critical. So anything you can do to promote these types of laws in your state, I, I highly recommend. And we're gonna talk about PA's changes um, sure. coming up. Now the traditional aftercare network, TAN for short, again, this is something that's in North Carolina, but again, many states have these programs. Um, it's an initiative from the Department of Public Safety within um, the uh, state of North Carolina, and it's partnering and collaborating with community organizations. It trains individuals, agencies, and organizations to mentor inmates. Again, um, just like peer mentoring, which is a pre service, it's something that's powerful no matter what age you are. You know, if you have some deficiencies in your social skills, having a mentor come alongside you and help develop those skills is critical. So having a program like this, uh, in Pennsylvania, we have certified peer specialists. Now that's a Medicaid billable service. It's something that my agency, the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services promoted, and it's now a Medicaid billable service. This is something similar to that, but this is, this is volunteers. But, um, and we'll talk more about what Pennsylvania has done to develop a forensic peer, a, a Medicaid billable service, but also be able to provide peer services on the inside of the institutions. So again, these are some initiatives, these are some programs that um, they're value added. You know, um, you might only be a rock against an asteroid to help the trajectory move just ever so slightly, but the more movement you can make with the more rocks you can throw against that asteroid of that person's life, the more uh, of the tangent or the, the trajectory can be changed towards positive uh, life-sustaining wages, being a part of their community, being a productive uh, citizen. Now we're gonna skip this uh, slide right now. We're gonna go to questions at the end. So we'll just move on to Pennsylvania resources and collaborators. So, you know, you've heard Randy and I talk about um, some things at a higher level, national level. Um, so this we're gonna get into um, PA resources and collaborators. What we have listed here, even though this is something that is um, from the Federal Department of Justice, uh, it is the um, training arm of the Department of Justice, it's called the National Institute of Corrections. It's a resource that Pennsylvania tapped into back in 2010. Uh, it's a, a series of trainings I was part of the first team that got trained. We went out of state to train. Uh, it was three weeks at the time when I did the training, but it's called the Offender Workforce Development Specialist, OWDS for short. And right now it's current, in its current state, it's two weeks in person and a practicum for a total of 12 weeks. It's very intense, as Kimberly can tell you herself, she went through the training as well. Um, intense enough that you can gain three college credits, but what is really so powerful about this is 
it takes a team of professionals, you know, VR, probation officers, uh, welfare office, uh, county assistance offices, um, workforce folks, corrections folks, um, uh, community civic organization staff, uh, service providers come together locally. Um, it's usually people that are like a one or two or three county region. They come together to develop a strategic plan and they implement that plan. And it's a very powerful thing because it's looking at many different perspectives of that individual's uh, life, um, needs that need to be addressed to help them be successful. And um, I can think of one specific example of a team that developed a job fair in Reading, Pennsylvania. So what they did was uh, they developed a, they call it a time offender friendly, but it's now a uh, returning citizen job fair. And they put a couple caveats in it. They said to the individuals, if you want to participate in this, you have to go through some um, pre-coursework to make sure that we feel you're ready to um, go and uh, make applications for jobs. So I call it the golden ticket, you know, just like with a walk in a chocolate factory. You had to have this ticket saying, yes, I took these five pre-courses in advance. I'm ready to, to interview um, today during this job fair. Also, too, uh, some aspects of what they've done that, that made it very helpful is they had hairstylists there to cut people's hair. They had people doing mock interviews. They had people doing, um, uh, helping them brush up resumes at the job fair so that these people were actually ready. So they weren't just showing up to businesses, acting as employers to hire these folks, but there were, it was a community effort to help these individuals put their lives back together. So I, again, I can't say enough about the Offender Workforce Development Specialist. It's a great training. You know, if it's something that you're interested in, you can definitely talk to Kimberly and myself afterwards about this. Um, it's, we're both trainers, we've, we've done this before, and it's a very powerful course to help develop strategic plans to help people uh, get employment with criminal records. Uh, now, also too, there's a two-day course called the Reentry Employment Specialist, RES for short. Um, again, it's, it's a very condensed version of the OWDS, and um, we bring in specifically partners from different disciplines, different fields of, of study, uh, again, probation, corrections, VR, workforce, uh, county assistance offices, uh, welfare, uh, community providers, to come together and talk, have the conversation about what do we need to do as a team to get, start people thinking about what resources need to be in place to help this person be successful. And just an example of what Pennsylvania has done since 2010, We've trained hundreds of professionals. We've trained 150 individuals, uh, professionals in the Offender Workforce Development Specialist. We trained over 500 individuals in the Reentry Employment Specialist training. And um, why it's important that, we, that we're mentioning this is this is something that is foundational. It starts a conversation, but it helps you define what you need to do, helps you create the narrative, helps you develop a strategic plan, which um, then you can implement and you can see, you can, it helps to move the needle in the lives of individuals with criminal records. So, and in regards to the next item we have, I mentioned about the memorandum of understanding, excuse me. Um, Pennsylvania OVR, Office of Vocational Rehabilitation and Department of Corrections, um, developed a memorandum of understanding in the early 2011, 2012. And what it was designed to do was to obtain records, uh, medical records, psychological records, educational records, vocational records in a consistent fashion because we have 25 facilities, state facilities across Pennsylvania, 46, 47,000 inmates, um, and 15 uh, OVR field offices across Pennsylvania. So how do we make those connections? How do we get consistency in terms of what's coming to us uh, when we make the request for documentation and uh, what the expectation is from DOC when we make that request? We had to put an MOU in place that listed everything out, you know, Form A, Form B, Form C, you know, that would consistently provide the information we needed to be able to uh, make the determine eligibility much more quickly. But also, too, we had to find out who were the points of contact within the state uh, correctional institutions. Because again, there's 16,000 people staff in these 25 facilities across Pennsylvania. How do we define 
who gets that information, the request, and sends the information out. So we had to define that as well. And again, it allowed uh, VR to uh, determine eligibility more quickly. Now again, Kimberly, as you mentioned, um, when we were talking about this, it didn't necessarily um, give everything that a person needed for uh, determining eligibility, but it was able to give some good uh, starting information, correct? Yeah. Um, well, the, the information that um, DOC does provide to us um, is the information they give us allows us to be able to, to, to determine that initial eligibility we definitely had, would receive enough medical records and enough of their history that that initial eligibility can be done. There may be things that you find out from that customer when you meet with them that you may need to get additional medical records or you may need to get additional, additional information and you may need to update that um, eligibility at a, later, at a later time. But part of that, like you said, was we, we through the MOU, we told them that we would, um, determine their eligibility within 60 days. And those records definitely give us the ability to, to do that. So, yeah. And one more component of what had to, what had to be in place to make the MOU successful or make the MOU work function was uh, we got permission from the Deputy Secretary of Corrections to be able to get records from Department of Corrections at no cost. Um, yes. Many cases, uh, in many cases, when let's say a lawyer is requesting medical records or the, requesting records from the um, Department of Corrections, they charge them like 25 cents a page or even more. Uh, that was big for us to be able to get these records at no cost because again, rather than having to pay, you know, potentially hundreds of dollars for this, this information, depending on how big the files were, uh, it allowed us to put the money towards, towards rehabilitation as opposed to documentation. So again, those are components of what could be seen as successful memorandums of understanding in your state if working with the Department of Corrections, getting information consistently so that you can determine eligibility more quickly and you can get um, a, a plethora of information, you know, their educational records, the vocation, you know, if they started uh, an HVAC program, um, but they're say they're, they need three or four modules to complete, at least you have the record of what modules that they complete and you, you know that you can use that to connect to um, uh, training programs in the, in, the, in the community so that they can finish their HVAC certification as opposed to starting over. Uh, another um, initiative that was done with the Department of Corrections, I mentioned earlier, we talked about the TAN, the um, volunteer training program, or volunteer um, mentoring program in North Carolina. This is a program that um, the state organization that provides grants to uh, different um, rehabilitation programs for people with criminal records, the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, uh, they provided in 2011 a grant to develop forensic peers in state correctional institutions. So the initial grant was issued in 2011. It was to train 100 individuals, uh, inmates, sometimes some of them were lifers, uh, meaning they were never going to get out, but they felt that it was going to be something that's going to help them help others who can be more successful, be successful uh, in leaving the facilities. And again, the initial project was to train 100. But since that time, over 500 individuals have been trained. And for those that have gotten out that have that certification, I can say there are many of them that are actually employed as forensic peer specialists in the community. They are getting a, a, a full-time position. Um, I can think of one specifically out of Philadelphia, a great gentleman, a powerful story, uh, and his ability to have that, that uh, um, certification to be able to, to help others and also make an income is a very, very powerful thing. Uh, and again, what it's doing is helping those with mental illness to be better prepared for the community. Um, also, too, another initiative that was done was the establishment of federal benefits, MOU. So the Department of Corrections and the Department of Human Services uh, developed in 2018 a, um, an memorandum of understanding so that when Johnny, Johnny Smith is getting out of the state corrections facility, his benefits are expedited. They're turned on more quickly than what had been done in times past. Um, so again, that's a memorandum of understanding. It provides consistency of what's going to happen for that individual when, um, uh, 
they're being released. And lastly, the Bureau of Community Corrections, um, that's another component of our State Department of Corrections. Uh, Kimberly had mentioned about individuals um, maybe serving two and a half years of a five-year sentence, been being out uh, uh, under parole for the remainder of the other two and a half years. Now, some individuals don't have what are called home plans, meaning they burn their bridges, they don't have a place to go, and um, they need some place to stay. So the Bureau of Community Corrections, it's almost like a halfway house. These individuals go there, and they typically are there until that um, conditions of parole are done, that two and a half years of a five-year sentence is done. Um, but what's nice about that is they have more freedoms. They're no longer considered inmates, but they're considered parolees. So they can work, they can find employment in the community. Uh, but the only challenge with that is if they're in, say, um, Philadelphia at a Bureau of Community Corrections facility, but they live in Pittsburgh, um, once they're done with their sentence, they've gotten to their five-year sentence and um, they are now released into their own recognizance. Um, if they have a job in Philadelphia, but they're going back to Pittsburgh, it makes it very difficult in terms of issues uh, with transferring the VRK. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So again, as you're getting more connected with your State Department of Corrections or whatever they call it, you know, in your state, you know, the state prison, um, what are the challenges that people are facing as they're um, leaving the facilities and how can you be mindful of it so you can plug in and help the individual be successful, help the system help the individual be successful. I'll turn it over to you, Kimberly. Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. There we go. Sorry, I was answering questions in the chat. Oh, um, <laughs> so, um, uh, the, in the Q&A, sorry, not in the chat. Um, so, things that are happening inside of um, the SDIs here in Pennsylvania. Um, I've got listed here job fairs, uh, pathways to success, and the transitional housing units and reentry services. So, the job fairs um, here in Pennsylvania, um, we have about 25 state correctional facilities. And I, I'm not sure exactly what year it started, but um, every year they have been doing um, job fairs for the guys that are inside, um, that are incarcerated. Um, so every single facility has one. Um, they bring in um, providers, they bring in employers. Um, so it provides them not only with job leads, but also for resources for when they reenter into the community. Um, so OVR is one of the people that's present there. Um, any other community agencies that want to that want to attend that are usually local into that to that area. Um, so that's one of the good things that's happening. Um, literally, um, Pennsylvania went on stay at home orders um, for the state on March 13th, and actually, I think it was the following week. These job fairs were about to start um, here in Pennsylvania. Um, the state correctional facilities are not allowing in any outside visitors. Um, so unfortunately, as of this year, none of these have been able to happen at this point in time. I don't know if we'll get back to the point by the end of the year whether any of these are going to happen this year or not. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see on that. The pathways to success, um, the uh, SCIs actually have a curriculum that they've develop, developed. It's called Pathways to Success. Um, some of the areas that that um, curriculum touches on is they do ONET interest profilers or you know, ONET interest in, um, assessments. Um, they look at jobs that aren't available. Um, there's a resource in a couple of slides that uh, Randy and I are going to talk about um, as to where they get that information from. Um, they teach them about understanding job opportunities, um, career, they teach them career pathways. Um, they talk about the opportunities in the SCIs. Um, they help them develop career plans. Um, they introduce them to the PA career link, which is the one-stop shop. Um, they work on resumes, cover letters, and teaching them how to fill out applications. Um, they teach them interview skills. Um, so this is a really good program to help get them prepared for employment when they're leaving and transitioning back into the community. Um, a lot of these services um, will start happening um, in the transitional housing units or THUs. 
um, or, or reentry services offices, which is the RSOs. Um, usually those guys that are in those programs are very, very close to being released, usually about 12 to 18 months out. Um, and those are usually the guys that I would go in and work with. Um, and we would start working on employment stuff um, while they're in the, one of those units. Um, they have a team that's in place there. They actually have a um, parole agent that actually works in those units with those guys to help them with that transition and help them, helping them get ready to, to go back out into the community. Anything else that you want to bring up, Randy, on that slide? Well, I think um, it's important that, uh, um, again, we look at meaning folks that are on the, on the call, on the conversation, what can you do to go in the facilities and let them know about what services are available in the community? Because I think it's important that um, uh, if there are individuals that are poised to be released from the facilities, um, they need to know what they're being released to. If there's just a bus ticket and a bunch of, a bag of clothes that they wore when they uh, came in to the facility waiting for them, they're not going to be successful. But if they can know that uh, there is a VR program, there are services in the community that can be uh, uh, offered to help a person be supported. Um, and also to find out uh, if they are under supervision, meaning have a parole officer, what can you do to connect to that parole officer so that you are on the same page um, systemically, philosophically, and um, they know what you can do for them and you know what they can do for you. So these are some of the training programs that are currently being offered in the SCIs here in Pennsylvania. Um, this is just a list of some of them. Some of the other programs that they offer is CAD, um, Computer Animated Drawing, I can't remember what it stands for. Do you know, Randy, off the top of your computer head? Aided, computer aided drawing. Yeah, um, drafted drawing or drawing draft or something like that. Um, custodial maintenance, um, they offer electronics, fiber optics, um, horticulture, um, machine shop masonry, um, optical assistant, um, restaurant trades, um, ward flex. Um, so, and these credits that they get can be transferred to colleges. And I know, uh, Randy, you have an interesting story on the horticulture from Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, the Philadelphia Horticultural Society uh, went into the Philadelphia uh, County Prison. So this isn't state, this is county prison. And they developed a horticultural program uh, with individuals that are incarcerated there. And um, they produce about 9,000 pounds of fresh vegetables a year. And they have about a 76% success rate of people getting jobs upon release. So they have those skills that they've learned and 76% of the people that, that have gone through this program that get out are able to find a job quickly because of the skill sets they've been, they've learned. So one of the other things that we've been working on is that some of these um, training programs that they have could possibly have the potential to be apprenticeship programs. So I have been in conversations with um, what we call ATO, is the pr Apprenticeship Training um, Office here, um, to see what we can do about changing some of these programs and seeing if it, there's not a possible potential for them to become apprenticeship programs in the future. Next slide. Sure. Sorry, right. I was uh, trying. Uh, no, it's okay. I was trying to respond to uh, the question. So, question number three: What does "ban the box" mean? Does it re mean removing cardboard boxes from prison common areas? Does it mean removing the criminal background question from employment applications? Does it mean prisons prohibiting boxing within the facility? Um, or does it mean that employers cannot ask criminal background questions during the interview? One of the panelists said two, or one of the panelists, one of the. I'm surprised no one answered. Well, someone answered three. Awesome. Yeah. 
went down to five seconds. Somebody else answered four and another two. Well, um, the correct answer is two, removing the criminal background question from employment applications. So uh, Band of Box is a national movement, but it's not something that is in every state. It's not something that's in every town. Uh, interesting enough, in Pennsylvania, for example, it's in Philadelphia. It was something that was put into um, codification in Phil or excuse me, in, in the Pittsburgh region, Allegheny County. But I, to this day, I don't know if it's actually implemented. So there are some uh, challenges that uh, municipalities, governments have with it in regards to implementing it because it's 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 um you know i don't think it's as controversial as it used to be but um some states have gone the whole state has gone ban the box uh, many cities across the country have gone ban the box if you look at ban box.com it's going to list all the areas they keep an active list of all the areas states municipalities counties that have gone to ban the box that's a very important thing in regards to helping a person Get in front of the employer, you know, because if the employer asks that question, is you ever have a criminal record or uh, committed a, a crime or whatever, depending on how it's asked, um, remove, removing that from the application allows a person to get that opportunity to tell their story in front of the employer. So uh, it's something that I think is very important and it allows um, the individual to have that opportunity to, to speak on their behalf. So some, you, of the, yep, so some of the Pennsylvania laws that um, we have here is the clean slate law and then legal limitations document. That's not really a law, but um, earlier when I told you that the pathways program and the SCIs that there was a document that they use, it's this legal limitations document to determine um, somebody's criminal background and their employment opportunities. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then ban the box, which is what ban, uh, Randy was just talking about. So, um, the clean site law, it's very similar to what we talked about earlier with um, North Carolina. Um, in Pennsylvania, though, um, ours began, we began automatically sealing records June 28th of 2019. Um, so statistically, by June 27th, which is in a couple of weeks from now, 2020, over 30 million cases will be sealed without the cost of filing petitions in the court. That's more than half of the charges in Pennsylvania's court's database. So that's the big thing with the um, clean slate law is it's an automatic process that um, these um, records are automatically being sealed and people aren't having to do anything to seal them. Um, previously, that's what you would have to do is you had to petition the courts to request the expungement and the sealing of the records where that's not happening anymore. So somebody prior to that date is still gonna have to petition the courts and, and have it sealed. Um, but it, it's, it's helping with that second chance, like Randy was explaining, it's, it's helping them have that opportunity um, at employment um, that they didn't have before because now people can't see that. You know, like I said before, with the same thing with North Carolina, the only people that can see that is either a district attorney or the courts um, or the, um, the police officers, like they're the only ones that can have access to those records once they've been expunged. So when somebody's getting a background check for their employment, the employer is not going to be able to see, um, these records, um, here in PA, um, they do have to wait. Um, so it, Arrest records will be sealed after charges are dropped and some conviction records will be sealed after 10 years. Um, so it may take a little bit longer in the state of PA to get your records sealed um, than it does in, in North Carolina. Cause it seems like and after seven years, if it was a misdemeanor, you guys were able to get your records sealed um, and for 10 years for a felony. So the legal limitations document, um, that is, was done by, um, Community Legal Services, or CLS. Um, it's a legal advocacy group. They're based in Philadelphia. Um, they work really, really hard to advocate for reentrance. 
Um, they've actually created this document um, that looks at different careers and it looks at the uh, charges that could impede you from going into that career. Um, I wouldn't say that it's, it's all inclusive or like totally, like if you have one of those career or one of those charges, you're never gonna get into this career, but it definitely addresses like, these are the ones that are gonna be, a, could possibly potentially be a barrier. Um, so it's a really good document, um, even though I know it's geared for PA and our criminal system and our laws and stuff, it could still be, for those of you in other states, it still could be a good starting point to like look and say, okay, well, you know, like Randy mentioned earlier, a doctor, like, so what could be some of the criminal charges that could impede them from becoming a doctor? And then researching your state to see if there's anything that you need to add or to delete from that document. But it could be a good starting point for you to start with. Um, the link to that document is either in the resources or the reference pages at the, bot at the end of the presentation. It's in a resources page. It's the um, resources page. Yeah, yeah, um, yep. So then the band the box, um, I found this very interesting. So I did some research on band the box. It actually started, I, I thought this was something very new and very recent and it's not. Um, band the box actually started in Hawaii in 1998. They were the first ones to ban the box. Did you know that Randy? I did not, I okay. did not. I, I learned something new too. So it's actually, as you were talking about, it is in Pittsburgh and it is in Philly. Um, it is currently in 33 states and in over 150 major cities across the United States. So it's, it, it's grown. It's, you know, more, in more and more cities. So I would suggest that you maybe do some research to find out if it is um, banned in your city or not. Um, it's usually most of your major cities. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I was going to jump to the next slide. If that's, Go ahead. If, uh, that's fine. Sure. Uh, and this is probably something that uh, folks are very interested in in regards to the inmate disability statistics. Uh, our national statistics are 32% within prisons and 40% within jails have a disability. And of those populations of the 32%, 40%, 54% in prisons have co-occurring, 53% in jails are co-occurring. And uh, this is an interesting statistic, and we'll talk briefly about a project that took place in Pennsylvania regarding a brain injury. Uh, the CDC indicates that anywhere between 25 and 87 percent of inmates report having experienced a head injury or traumatic brain injury. And the reason they vary is because, one, how is it uh, assessed? A lot of uh, therapists are not trained, uh, medical doctors are not trained uh, um, uh, to identify that type of thing amongst inmates. Uh, it's something that, um, again, depending on how well um, jails and <clears throat> prisons are doing the assessment to determine uh, if the person has brain injury, that's why the, the wide variety of, of um, uh, percentage across uh, uh, jails and prisons across Pennsylvania. And specifically dialing into North Carolina, um, in 2016-17, uh, they saw that 71% of the people screened for mental, uh, for substance abuse, excuse me, needed long-term treatment, and about 25,000 people with serious mental illness annually enter the jails. So again, the jails, prisons are, jails and prisons, excuse me, are the largest mental health providers in the country because so many people with mental illness are going into the jails. So many people with, with um, uh, substance abuse issues are going into the jails. So I just wanted to throw that out there for consideration uh, in regards to there are a lot of individuals, a high percentage, much higher than the general population, that have a disability that could benefit from VR services that, that are in corrections. And Randy, I just want to say on that last slide, I saw some people asking about whether somebody being in prison was what qualified them for VR services. And it's not, this is what qualifies people for VR services, right. is, is this, the TBIs, the, the uh, drug and alcohol issues that's what's gonna qualify somebody for VR services. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So traumatic brain injury research, Pennsylvania um, has done a research um, study. Um, we did a pilot, it was with SCI Graterford. Um, the first time we did it, um, that um, prison facility has actually been closed 
Um, there was actually a report, um, it was in the 2018 Journal of Offender Rehabilitation. So anybody that wants to go read the report, I'll give you real quick. It was in volume 57 of the 2018, issue eight, pages 562 to 585. Um, and it was in that uh, Journal of Offender Rehabilitation. Um, the um, research was actually published there. Um, in that research, they looked at SEI Graterford. There was 163 um, guys that they looked at. Um, and 75% of them that were screened reported an event or events that could have resulted in um, brain injury. Um, so on an average, the report said that there was like 3.8 traumatic brain injury incidents per, uh, re or per person, individual. Per, per individual. So it wasn't just one traumatic brain injury that most of these guys had, it was multiple traumatic brain injuries. And so when they're coming out, you're wondering why they can't, you know, get to their appointments on time, why they're forgetting appointments. I mean, their whole frontal lobe and their executive functioning is, is in, impeded. And, you know, so they needed some assistance. So in this research, what they actually did is they had a case manager um, that worked with these guys. And the, the neat thing about it was, is because that case manager was inside the prison before they left that case manager stayed with them as they transitioned into the community. And when they went into the community, that um, case manager also assisted them in filling out the applications um, for OVR, uh, maybe for medical assistance, whatever services that they needed, they were there to, for that support to be able to hold them and, and get them through this because somebody with a traumatic brain injury, the OVR process is astronomical. I mean, so, it was very hard for them to do and they wouldn't follow through. They were missing appointments. So that's, that was the, the nice thing about all of this. Um, we are getting ready to do another study um, again, because of COVID-19 it's been postponed, but they are ready to do this um, with SCI um, Phoenix and SCI um, Chester. Um, and these, these are state prisons. That's what SCI basically is a state prison. Yes. And, and actually, uh, can I jump in to yeah, talk about the, the, uh, the HRSA grants as well? What happened uh, in the study, um, it was found out that 74% of the individuals that uh, were in the study, the 163 men, 74% um, of them indicated that they had acquired their brain injury prior to age 21. So with that, the uh, project took this data and applied for two HRSA grants, federal grants, and they got two more grants to go into county juvenile development facilities, Bucks County, which is uh, in the Philadelphia region, and Montgomery County, which is also in the Philadelphia region. And they were finding basically the same statistics about 60%, um, just under 60% of individuals had uh, acquired brain injury. Now, it wasn't necessarily a traumatic brain injury, but upon uh, doing a little deeper dive, they found that about 45% of that 60% had traumatic brain injury. So they had enough uh, uh, concussions, enough hits, blows to the head that gave them traumatic brain injury. So again, uh, a, uh, an invisible disability that is very common in the prison system. And um, it's something that, again, these are individuals that need VR services to be able to be successful. And um, wanting to move on, We'll move to question four. So Kimberly, you want to go ahead and ask the question? So is it a good idea to have a list of businesses that hire people with criminal records to give to an individual with a criminal record? Yes or no? Somebody put in the chat, no. <laughs> And we'll go. Well, they put no. They put two, which is right. no. Right. We'll go no, about another uh, five seconds. Somebody just put depends. No. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. Okay, uh, and the answer is yes and no, and I'll just quickly explain why. Uh, if you know the individual's background, if you know their record, if you know their disability, if you know, if you've worked with them enough to know that um, 
they're ready for the job search, then yes. But if they're not, then no. And what I mean by that is um, I've heard many probation and parole officers saying, yeah, I have this list of 10 or 12 different employers that I tell the guys, you know, and women, you know, upon uh, hitting the streets, they're now under my supervision, go and find a job. Here's 10 places to go. Know nothing about this person's ability to go to the job, know nothing about job matching, if this person is, it, is really going to be a good fit for these employers. So if the information, if you have good information, you have a good match, that this person that you're going to be sending to this, this business as the employer is going to be a good match for them, then the answer is yes. But I don't like folks just saying, hey, here's a list, go find, you know, go to these 10 employers. We don't want to be sending people that are not ready for the job search to these businesses. We don't want to burn bridges. So it's yes and no, but it's dependent upon how you're handling how this information is going to these individuals and how ready are these individuals for the, for the job search. Kimberly? So employer roundtables. This was something that was happening here in PA. Um, we were actually having roundtable discussions. Um, it was everybody from the secretary of DOC and his staff clear down to employers from the county, a labor and industry. Um, the secretary was present. OVRs there, um, politicians, reentry service providers, and workforce. So all of these people were around this table. Um, we met at an employer that was reentry friendly, um, and we had discussions and kind of debunking those myths of, you know, oh, if I hire somebody that has a criminal history, they're going to steal from me. They're going to they're going to be bad. You know, blah blah blah. Um, and they actually had um, one of their. Um, employees that is a um was a was a had a criminal record actually came in and talked to the employee employers that were there um so it just was really good conversations um and these are things that just need to be had um not only in pa and across the state but in other states i'm um, just having those to those conversations go ahead to the next slide okay thanks kimberly um and we'll just briefly, as we finish out our presentation, we'll just talk about some partners. The, uh, we talked about the Department of Corrections and the state correctional institutions and what's been going on inside the state correctional institutions. We did touch on um, probation and parole. We want to talk to the PA Board of Probation and Parole. Now, they are primarily <coughs> providing probation at the state level, or excuse me, pro parole at the state level, but they provide a lot of training and funding for probation officers across Pennsylvania. And they have some uh, specific uh, parole officers that are called ASCRAs for short. It's Assessment, Sanctioning, and Community Resource Agent. And basically they're doing rehabilitation types of stuff with individuals as opposed to um, uh, dealing with the criminogenic or the, the criminal record aspect of things or helping individuals to be successful, helping them to uh, work, you know, having the lists that are appropriate because they know the person's ready for that job search. They have the Bureau of Community Corrections as we mentioned earlier. Um, they have reentry parole agents that are part of the offenders unit team. Uh, we talked about the RSO earlier. So again, as these individuals are in these RSOs, um, in the, in the uh, uh, prisons, they're ready to get out. They're getting close to being getting out. The parole agent is there to making that connection to the community to help connect them to the community once they've returned. And the um, probation, Parole officers are excellent community partners. As we mentioned earlier, they have access to criminal records and they can develop sensible terms of supervision. Again, as being agents of the court, they can make changes to these terms of supervision. So um, it's not something that can't be changed, but also too, you can help the, uh, you can work with them if they familiar with what VR is and what VR can do, they can help to integrate um, uh, your programming into what's happening with supervision so that the person isn't just getting punitive conditions of supervision, but it's something that's helping them connect to success. And we'll talk about the PA Commission on Crime and Delinquency uh, and the reentry coalitions. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, every state has something similar to the PCCD. In Pennsylvania, it's called the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. It's a grant issuing state agency. It's equal to the Governor's Crime Commission in North Carolina. Every state has one because it's a federally funded program. And um, the TBI project we talked about where assessment of brain injury was done, 
and the forensic peer project where peers were trained inside the institutions of state correctional to state prisons uh, that was funded by the PCCD and I, they're looking for different types of projects to fund so if you get plugged into them and them being a grant issuing agency there may be projects that you can develop together to um, be able to do something that's rehabilitative in nature and helping people to return to the community with the right kind of supports. Now at the local level, there are PA reentry coalitions and um, in North Carolina, they're called the reentry councils. Uh, in Pennsylvania, it's called the County Justice Advisory Boards, the CJABs, and North Carolina, it's called the Criminal Justice Advisory Board. These are local programs that are in every county. And I looked across different state titles and they were called advisory boards, they were called commissions, they were called groups, it varies upon the state. So um, be on the lookout, do a bolo as it were, for your local level reentry coalitions, reentry councils, those organizations that are dedicated to helping people reenter re successfully. Now, we'll take questions. Um, so Heidi and Beth, if you wanna give us some of the questions that were thrown our way, some deep level questions. I tried to uh, answer a few of the questions, I know Kimberly did as well, but there are probably some many more questions that we weren't able to answer quickly. Yeah, no problem. Um, thanks, Randy. This is Beth. Um, just so everyone knows, I'm having some tech issues, so sorry that my video is not up and I hope my audio comes through okay. Um, just to revisit a couple of the questions that you already got to, um, there were a couple of people who had asked about expungement. Could you just real quick share with the group, um, you know, how you go about getting that? Because you had answered those, but I had seen there were a couple, so I just want to make sure, sure. sure in case others have that question as well. Well, expungement, unfortunately, is an expensive option, and it can take some time. So my advice is, if you have somebody that says, hey, I want to get my record expunged before I start looking for work, I say, no, stop them right there, be polite about it, but say, let's help you find a job first, gain an income, start getting your work history going, and then start working towards expungement. That's not something that they want to do. I mean, when individuals get out, you know, they're raring to go, you know, they could conditions of supervision. So, the, you know, they got someone, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing, you know, the carrot and stick, there's a stick of the probation officer, parole officer. You don't want them to go down that path immediately. That's something they can do eventually, but one, it's expensive, and two, it takes time. So they don't have time because the probation officer, parole officer is saying, hey, we want you to get a job within X number of days, blah, blah, blah. So work on expungement after they've gotten their first job or after they've gotten themselves established with a career path. That's my advice. Um, it can be done, it is expensive, and it doesn't always come out with, you know, your records live forever on the internet. So um, it's something that you have to take care with. It's just like the uh, list of uh, offender-friendly employers. You have to take care, you have to look at each person's individual case. Oops. Thanks, Randy. Um, and then the next question I have is one that also kind of came up that you had already answered, and that one was talking about a more specific situation. But um, the question is asking for suggestions uh, for working with clients who have violent offender convictions. Kimberly, you want to try that, or do you want me to jump in? Say that again. Someone with a violent, uh, violent <coughs> uh, criminal record. How do you help somebody with a violent criminal record? Um, I think it would be a matter of looking at, you know, what is that violent crime? Um, unfortunately, that is one of the harder ones to, to place, um, and so is sex offenders. Um, those are probably the two most difficult um, criminal histories to, to work with. Um, you just need to make those relationships with the employers in your in your area to find out who um, you're definitely not going to want to put them you know in certain jobs um, Randy do you have like well, I was gonna, like I was gonna say you know, warehouses yeah warehouses are, are good businesses as a starting point to help them develop a work history you know they're away from people they're away from from um, from uh, a variety of different temptations and whatnot. So warehouse jobs are probably a good starting point for persons with those records. You know, unfortunately, it doesn't matter what kind of training they may have had, what kind of formalized training they had. 
because of the nature of their crime, it can be very difficult for them to find employment. And indeed, someone asked a question, is self-employment an option uh, for some folks? And I would say self-employment is something that's strong, I would strongly consider as well, because mm -hmm. um, it takes a person with a criminal record probably about uh, eight to 10 years to, to really get to a life-sustaining wage simply because of their record. Um, so I would recommend if the person has the capability to develop a, a self-employment plan and it's something that seems viable, that might be a good option too, because even if you have a felony, you can have your own business, you know, you're the boss. So, um, that's possibly a consideration as well. Again, I, you know, wouldn't say everybody go that route, but self-employment for a person with a high skill set might be an option for them if they, they show the, the. Uh, business, have the business sense, it could be an option for them. Randy, do you want to advance that last slide so our contact information is, sure. is up there? We'll still okay. take questions, but we wanted to put this information up in case uh, you wanted to reach out to us at a later date. I, I believe it was uh, shown in the chat box too at the beginning. But um, Beth, what other questions are there out there? Um, so the next one comes from George. He's asking, earlier you mentioned working with the probation officer for the prologue to get a full picture of the offender situation. How do you handle issues of confidentiality in that situation? Well, <laughs> um, usually probation and parole officers don't have to worry about the same level of confidentiality um, as, as maybe you or I would have to. But again, you'd have to get, you want to make sure that um, you're getting full permission from the individual you're working with. Uh, and say, you know, in order for me to get this information, I really need to talk to your probation and parole officer. So you need to get permission, I would say, from the VR side of things. You need to get permission from, from the individual. So I wouldn't proceed until, you, until you've gotten that in writing. You know, just like a release of information for any other, any other uh, situation, you're going to want to do the same thing. Kimberly, any thoughts? Yeah, that, I mean, I would say the same thing. It's just those releases of information. Um, I think as long as you're up front and up, you know, up front with the customer um, as to what you need and why you need it. I mean, and you have the release signed, I mean, right. kind of not confidential at that point in time because they've given you permission to get it. Uh, what, what other questions do we have? Uh, the next one comes from Kathleen. It says, when you say expungement is not visible to public, what about when background checks are done on the state level? Well, and um, I'm not sure, uh, Kimberly, you, you mentioned about the fair, fair, um, the fair hiring law from, from North Carolina. I think that's what she's referring to. And um, I would say that uh, when records are expunged, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the information unfortunately lives forever on the internet. So again, it takes making sure that the individual is aware that this stuff might happen, that you know, as the uh, employer does a background check, um, uh, even if they're looking for an arrest record, if it shows up that a person has an arrest record, that might be something that gets the person tossed from being considered. You know, um, the, uh, it may have never turned into conviction, but it was something that shows up in the, in the system in, in the background check. So again, I think you have to take care in regards to what exactly is the person asking to be done. Now expungement, of course, is, is to remove the, the record. But even juvenile justice records are quote unquote expunged when a person leaves the system. You know, if they don't get an adult charge and they leave the juvenile justice system, that system or that, that record is expunged. But with the advent of technology, you know, and background checks, uh, that stuff unfortunately lives on forever. So it's not an it's not a perfect system. And you have to uh, help your individual that you're working with be aware that there may be uh, ghosts that exist in the system that, that pop up. So I think, one, you have to help the individual. You yourself need to know what the individual's record is. That's why talking to a probation officer or parole officer is very helpful. But two, they need to be educated on what their record is so that they can say, no, I, you know, this has been explained, just no longer exists. This information that you have it shouldn't exist because it was been, been expunged. I've shown my good behavior. I've done these things. You know, I have a family. I've gone back to school. Blah blah blah. You know, so um, it's as much uh, what the individual is, is doing and how they're putting themselves out there, how they're um, promoting themselves to, to advocate on uh, what they've done and 
um, why that information isn't false. So again, there, there are those barriers that do exist. Um, and the reason I'm talking so much about it is because um, expungement sounds like a great idea. It is a good idea, but it's expensive. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to remove everything that's out on the, on the internet. Thanks, Randy. Um, the next question comes from Richard, and it's asking, uh, for states where VR is operating under an order of selection, how has that impacted serving re-entering citizens with disabilities? I'll throw that one to you, Kimberly. Say it again. I'm sorry. I've tried to or, multitask. Or, or, order of <laughs> selection. Right. How's the order of selection affected uh, um, providing services to people with criminal records? So Pennsylvania is one of the few states that we are on a closed order of selection. Um, so basically they have to apply for services. Um, they will sit on the wait list. Their eligibility can be determined, but they will be sitting on a wait list until we open up and they can come through. And that's based on the date of their application. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, the next one, Give me one second here. Okay, the next one comes from Charles. It says, the population I served in Florida, I learned there are a very limited amount of resources available for SOs. Even the services intended for reintegration could not serve these individuals. If I may, is Florida the only state that sees this lack of services for this population? Um, not knowing how all 50 states and the territories as well are operating, I would say probably not. Um, yeah, I don't think you know, so either. I, I think that uh, um, you're going to find those pockets of, of uh, lack of resources, shall we say, uh, across the country. Uh, and, and just because Pennsylvania is, we're talking about what we've been doing in Pennsylvania, believe me, that doesn't mean that we, we are lack, we have a plethora of resources. We don't. We've just looked at what can we do um, just, to, just to move the needle a little bit in regards to uh, making those connections. Uh, like, for example, even if you could get something with the Department of Corrections to get um, uh, the records at no cost, you know, co copied and sent at no cost, those are the little kinds of things that can help make change. It's not a lot, but it's, a, it's something. And that's kind of where we started, you know, and uh, again, I started working with Department of Corrections probably in 2009, 2010, and it took many years. I mean, it wasn't until... Um, I've left the position, Kimberly actually replaced me uh, in the state VR agency, and uh, it took uh, a full seven years for the juvenile justice one to, to MOU to go into place. And um, a lot of what we started back in the early 2010s didn't really come to fruition until now. So it's, it's, it's like making wine. <laughs> it's the best way I can describe it. You know, you know what you want to do. You know what the intention is but don't be surprised that it's going to take some time to get to the point where it's actually making, making something happen. Yeah. And just to follow, follow up on Charles's question, um, we have folks on this webinar from all around the country. So if other people want to chime in, in the chat about what resources are available um, in your state for um, re-entering sex offenders, um, you know, if you have resources you can share, or, you know, if you're one of those states that's experiencing a gap, feel free to um, chime in on the chat and kind of let us know where you're at as well, because, you know, we want to share resources across different lines if we can. I know that's not always possible, but feel free to chime in on the chat. Well, and I do apologize. I didn't, I didn't realize what the acronym SO meant. So um, sexual offender, yes, that is a very challenging population to work with. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I think that, again, warehouse, warehouse positions, possibly self-employment, you know, someplace where the person's going to be away from the public, that's likely the most ideal position that's going to uh, bear some fruit for this person. Um, it's just, it's the nature of the crime that they've committed, you know, unfortunately. Uh, the next question comes from Matthew. It's asking, when a returning citizen is applying for a position with vulnerable populations, if the box regarding criminal background is removed, how does an employer protect the client who is a member of a vulnerable population? So my inter my my view on the it's ban the box. So it's only to ban the box on the application. 
um, it at so at the time that the uh, conditional offer is is done, that's when the person needs to be disclosing their criminal history. It does not eliminate them disclosing that information. Um, and maybe that's not the most appropriate job for that person. Um, if they have that, that kind of a history um, and there's a vulnerable person there, you know, maybe the employer needs to, because again, it's a conditional job offer. And once that's known, maybe they put him somewhere else in the company um, that he wouldn't be exposed to that person. Um, maybe there's something that they can do to look at where they don't cross paths, working on separate shifts, something like that. It doesn't mean that they can't offer him the job, um, but those are things that the customer, the individual just needs to disclose. Um, and at the point of a conditional job offer, that's when those things need to be discussed because that's what the purpose of Band the Box was, is to get that interview so that they could actually get the conditional job offer. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, the next question is from Stephanie. It's asking, what is the best way to ask an employer if they're CORI slash SORI friendly? You're talking about re-entry friendly? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not super familiar with those acronyms, so I'm... I'm, I'm assuming it's re-entry or... or um, um, so... I, to me, just ask the question, you know, and, and I've done it, you know, are you opposed to hiring somebody that has a criminal record? And I, I mean, I've asked employers um, and usually I don't get turned down or a lot of times it's, well, we can hire anything, but we may not be able to hire somebody that has a assault charge or, you know, depending, I mean, retail, they can't hire somebody that's got retail theft. So, I mean, there, it doesn't preclude everything, but it may preclude certain offenses. Um, so I, I think it's just you ask the question. Well, I think too, it's like um, you could ask the question of, of the business saying, you know, I have the perfect person for you, but they have, you know, if I had a perfect person for you, um, but they had a criminal record, would you be willing to hire them? So I think um, depending upon what the need is, I think before the pandemic, you know, businesses were, were clamoring for people after the pandemic. I don't know what's going to be happening, so it should be interesting to see. But hopefully a year from now, we're back to the situation where people are clamoring for employees. So uh, it might be an easier ask to make at that time, but um, we'll have to see. 